G'day, I'm Dr. Kev. I've got Harley here, and what are we going to do today, Harley? I'm going to talk about how I plagiarised your work using AI. Welcome to Car Design Workshop. So what is it that you actually did? I took one of your earlier videos on lap time simulations for the Series 1 Lotus Elise, and I fed the results into a LLM and used it to generate a Python script that could replicate the result. So LLM, uh, you mean AI there, or what people would call so generative AI? So we're talking about a type of generative AI, you yeah, know, utilizing LLMs, the most, the most common ones that uh, you'll see the people talk about on the media, things like ChatGPT, Grok, Gemini, um, are some of the more common ones that people have access to in the, the public space. So if you haven't seen it, in an earlier video, I created an acceleration simulation so I could predict zero to 100 times of the Project 171. So I guess I used time and expertise to do this. Uh, what sort of tools did you use? Uh, mostly brute force and ignorance. <laughs> so what exact tools did you use? So for my simulation, I used a combination of ChatGPT and Gemini. I chose these tools um, primarily because they're free and readily available to access um, on the internet. There are coding specific tools that you can utilize, um, but I've chosen these to illustrate the capabilities of the average person. And the final code, this ended up being MATLAB or? So again, I chose Python script for this. Um, it's, it's open source, free, anybody can access. Um, MATLAB is, is of course closed source um, and has a cost associated with its utilization. So we can see the results of Harley's work here and the graphs are very similar to what I'd produced for my own simulation. We're seeing speed, acceleration and distance versus time as well as a traction model. And I'm pretty annoyed because it's got a nice, pretty cool RPM graph as well. And a lot of these inputs that you can see can be entered and changed in this GUI. Whereas the MATLAB one I'd created, they were all in a text-based entry. So I'm really keen to dig down into the exact process that you used here. Uh, how did you get the data that you're going to use in this simulation? So I took some of the physics calculations, the critical um, items that you were interested in your simulation and your video link um, specifically. Uh, and I asked the LLM to generate a simulation based on those inputs. So it was just given the video link and you were able to then grab information straight out of the video, just from a link. Initially, it was able to pull all the relevant information for the simulation, it's just from the link, yes. When you had a look at the code behind this and the specs that it had chosen, were there any discrepancies between what I'd shown in the video and what was appearing in the code? Yeah, so initially, um, given that the prompt was fairly, fairly broad, there were some issues with things like the physics calculations. Um, the code also didn't run. So um, there's a little bit of back and forth involved with the LLM, getting it to correct some of the errors that it introduced in those initial prompts. So we've got data that's come from the videos and probably some that's scraped from the internet. Uh, how did you start with, I guess, the whole prompting of creating the simulation then? So from those initial prompts, we were gener able to generate a basic model that ran even with a basic GUI. But as I mentioned before, there were some issues with the physics. The model didn't run quite correct. So what I was able to do was take the outputs from that model, feed it back in as another prompt to the LLM and ask it to help me to correct those issues. So was that a really big prompt to start with? Did you have to give it a lot of direction or? So I tried a couple of methods with the, the prompt process. Initially, I tried feeding it all of the raw information that I wanted it to process and asked it to generate the simulation. And it generated, to be frank, a whole lot of garbage, particularly GPT. So the approach that I then took was to pare down the model a little bit, or at least my requests for the model initially, and asked for the basic simulation that we talked about before, just representing the physics at a very, very high level of what we're interested in, in this, in this video. Okay. So you toned it down to a more, uh, basic uh, simulation that then that became what, a foundation for moving forwards. Basically. Yes. So that formed the foundation of, of the, the simulation. And from there I was able to layer complexity on top of it, which I did myself rather than allowing the model to hallucinate with iteration after iteration. So you say hallucinate, I guess this is where. Uh, an AI or an LLM will almost make something up. Is there any, any examples of things that it did in the physics model there? 
So an example would be, um, despite having access to the, the physics from your video, um, in downforce calculations, rather than using a proper formula, it approximated downforce as 0.3 of the drag force calculation, which was correct. So upon reviewing that, I was able to go through and, and modify it so that it was, was correct. Yeah. Okay. So some ratio to it, but it had just picked the ratio. Yeah, correct. So it may have scraped that from a forum somewhere or, or possibly a textbook as a rough idea. Um, the problem being that it didn't actually replicate what it asked it to do in this case. So there was a, I guess, is this a process of you checking the physics and checking the maths involved? Yeah. So there's a, there's a little bit of back and forth with running the model, checking the outputs, uh, making sure they match approximately um, what I'm looking for. Uh, and then from there, layering on some additional complexity once I was happy that the the actual math that it was doing and the loop that it was running was actually correct. So you've mentioned that you were so correcting the broken features and that you know, I'm sure AI was able to help with that process. And um, What were some of the features that the, you then began to layer into the simulation? Sure. So... We started with a very basic GUI, just a, an acceleration simulation showing zero to hundred time. But as you alluded to in your earlier acceleration video, we're interested in more than just that. So I incorporated some modified graphs. I incorporated editable inputs so we can iterate on the design that we're looking at. I also incorporated a real time simulation functionality so that we could watch the simulation occur in real time if we wanted to. So an example of some of the more complicated features that you talked about in your MATLAB simulation was the weight transfer calculations for a rear-wheel drive vehicle. That was an individual prompt uh, where I specifically told it what I was looking for, how I wanted to incorporate it into the GUI, and asked it to generate some code which I could then incorporate into the base program that we talked about before. So feasibly, you could you could probably use this same process to include things that I hadn't included in the model. I mean, mine was a fairly basic model. It was a fairly basic, uh, tire model in particular, and you'd be able to use, I guess, something like this process to bring in information from other people to, to make it even better than the original. Yeah, correct. In fact, you were even, I was even able to prompt the LLM and, and ask how it might improve the simulation and a more advanced tire model as an example of, of what it suggested. I have a very fragile ego, so I don't need an AI telling me how I did things wrong. No, have enough people doing that as it is. Another example would be the clutch slipping in order to replicate the acceleration at launch. The initial model had a very basic approximation of what would occur at launch and didn't allow the clutch to slip. So it would calculate a much lower torque from the engine, which slowed down the zero to 100 time quite considerably, which in the case of this simulation was something we were very much interested in. So I guess one of the obvious questions is how long did this whole process take? Oh, 20 minutes, give or take. <laughs> Tell me that. It's not 20 minutes. How long did it really take? So to generate the initial um, physics model that could output results that we were actually interested in, probably about an hour. Um, refining the GUI and adding the additional graphs, things like the tractive effort curve, incorporating the weight transfer model um, in a way that made sense, that was readable, that flowed in the code, probably another four to six hours. Yeah. So, and how many lines of code did you end up with? Around 400. Okay. Well, that's, that's quicker than I did the MATLAB program in, and you've already got some functionality there in terms of ed editable things that, that I didn't have. So that's, um, disappointing, <laughs> disappointing in that AI has probably replaced a bunch of, uh, the knowledge there. Um, so I guess what were some of the problems that you faced when you hit this process or you're applying this process? So I was interested initially in applying, um, an iterative approach whereby I allowed the LLM to control the base of the code. So essentially asking it to iterate on the entire program and incorporate features as I requested them. Um, I found this to be a very flawed practice, um, mostly because the LLM with additional prompts will start to hallucinate. Um, it would remove entire sections of code uh, when prompted to add an additional feature. Uh, it would also often break code with new iterations of features that you'd requested. So I guess that's somewhat to be expected. Uh, we're working with a computer here. It's not a person. They're very open-ended questions. And I guess you're dealing with 
imprecise instruction with this. Yeah, exactly. So the approach that I chose to take uh, instead um, was, as I mentioned before, generate a, a base model that would function and simulate results, and then the layered approach from there. So I would ask it for assistance to incorporate additional features into the model, such as the weight transfer that we talked about before, or the improvements for the error downforce calculation, the ability to output the code into a CSV file once the simulation is run, um, things like that layered on sequentially helped to maintain the base code and the functionality um, whilst ensuring we could make it more complicated and do the things that we wanted to do with it. So I guess one of the things that I've been looking at when I do simulations is trying to make sure that they run effectively in time so that you could really do a lot of iterations and see uh, how something changes as you're changing the variables. So did the simulation run particularly fast? So initially, no, there were some problems. Um, a good example is the real-time SIM functionality that I incorporated fairly early on in, in the process. Um, the AI generated a, a duplicate of the code um, so that when I would hit the button, uh, it would run that section of code repeatedly. Mm -hmm. And in order to replicate the real-time functionality that I was asking for, synchronizing it with, with the time, it would clear all of the data that it had calculated for each data point and then recalculate it, which made it very slow. Um, once I realized that this is what it was doing, I was able to prompt the LLM and, and say, listen, you've, you've made a very inefficient section of code here. Could you help me to improve it? It was able to fix that. So you obviously need some knowledge, I guess, of programming and algorithms in order to make a efficient code. Did the code come out error-free or did you also have to do some debugging on things like syntax? So not entirely. Um, you're right. It does occasionally output errors with things like parentheses and variables. Thankfully, if you feed it the error code back, usually the LLM is able to diagnose fairly effectively what the problem is and help you to resolve it. And so you're using it as its own debugging tool as well? Yeah, correct. So I know there's been quite a lot of talk about the use of generative AI tools. I know that I'm involved in teaching. It's a very big issue there and also involved with engineering. And obviously these are, are, can be very useful tools when they're well used. What do you think are some of the, I guess, the main benefits of using these tools? So I think the main benefit is uh, the obvious one, which is the increase in, in productivity. Um, there's a lot of pitfalls associated with that. So for example, you can very easily um, use the garbage in, garbage out analogy. If you don't actually understand what the LLM is providing to you and you use it blindly, such as the physics calculations from before, you can very easily run into a pitfall whereby you produce garbage without actually understanding the output that you're getting. So you're seeing it more as a tool to speed up somebody that's already able to do the engineering rather than being a replacement for those skills. Yeah, I don't think it's a replacement for an engineer, but it makes an engineer more efficient at what they do. I think one thing that I've gathered from the conversation is that even though it's these tools, you've chosen tools that are freely available. I'm not sure that we'd say that this is a free process because there's a lot of that expertise and, and knowledge that's gone in in order to make sure that the result is useful. I mean, the results can look good from the output, but without that interpretation, you really don't know if it's right or not. Yeah, so it's important to understand the physics or the calculations that are occurring in the background for an example like this. I guess I'm a little bit torn when applying these sorts of tools to the engineering process, because I think there's, there's real gains where you have that productivity, but the AI can work or the LLMs can work on the fun things as well as the boring things. So great to have something helping with code and, and writing, but I'm not sure that I'd want to have it do the modeling for instance i love doing the cad work how do you find i guess in in a workplace or as working as an engineer where does that line for you between the sort of passion of the work and the productivity increases i think you're exactly right there dr kev there's some things as engineers that we love to do and some things that we we love to do a lot less um, things like repetitive workflows that can be automated um, or coding in that example um, I don't have a passion for, for coding. Um, I do have a passion for cars and analyzing the results of things like outputs from these simulations. I guess the line there is, where is the 
creative solution versus, I guess, the objective solution. So, so we have some things that are subjective, some things that are objective, and where does AI excel in that? So I think if you're asking the AI if uh, force equals mass times acceleration, that's an excellent use case for plugging it in and, and automating that, that workflow as much as you can. The line for me sits with the creative endeavors, things like CAD modeling, car body design, some of the more creative aspects of engineering that an LLM may not necessarily produce the best output with. And I think we're not even touching some of the issues about where AIs are getting this information. So they're scraping things off the internet and even concerns around, I guess, increasingly feeding itself. So scraping AI content and certainly some of the, I guess, moral implications of what it means to uh, borrow from people's work. I guess I feel probably a little bit uneasy about how easy it was for the AI to go through a video and pull information out of that and produce something so quickly. Um, I guess at the end, the, the videos here are intended to educate and help people to do this. And it's probably not a surprise that it helps AI as well. I just didn't think that I'd be training AI models in this channel. So we're keen to hear your comments about AI and its use in engineering and how much should be used in these sorts of projects that are more passion projects. Thanks for your time. Car design workshop. Design, build, improve. For, for all your merchandise needs. So if you haven't seen it, in an earlier video, I created an acceleration simulation using MATLAB. Oh no. <laughs> Thanks for that. Sorry. <laughs> um, they might actually keep that in. <laughs> I realize I interrupted you. I'm like, shoot. <laughs> but you might be able to use it. This is going way off the rails. We'll see how that, that edits out. Um, okay, I'll start again. <laughs> Sorry, Kev. You can tell I'm uh, an expert at filming. Also, you stole some of my lines. I did. <laughs> in, I did. In this one. <laughs> yeah. um, things we like doing, things we don't like doing. <laughs> Kev's the one that's plagiarizing my work in this case. <laughs> we should do this at the end. <laughs> we'll do an outtakes. <laughs> there you go.